We're holding in Sefer Mishleo. We're just about almost done with the Sefer. Perek Chavav, chapter 26. So we have about, probably about uh, 10 weeks or so left of Sefer Mishle. We'll see, Bezat Hashem. Yeah. Chapter 26, yeah. Kashelek Bakaitz Vechamatar Bakatsir Kendo Navelech Sil Kavod. In this chapter, he's going to talk a lot about laziness. He's going to talk about Kasil, about those who behave in a foolish way. So perhaps I, I, I should give you an introduction to better understand why he's criticizing, it appears to be that he's making fun or criticizing certain midot, certain characteristics that certain individuals have. What's the purpose of all the criticism? It's not just to teach lessons. It's not just to make us aware of him. There's something a lot more important in Sefer Mishle, and that is we have the ability to change ourselves. And that's a mistake that many people make, uh, believing that they were born in a certain way, whether it's homosexuals, or whether it's people who are lazy, or temperamental. They were told, or they think that it's, it's something that cannot be controlled. It's, they were born with it. We don't need to get into the discussion as to how these uh, characteristics develop or evolve, whether it's by birth, whether it's later on through something that they experienced in their life that made them be the way they are it's not important anymore you know there are psychologists that argue amongst themselves where do certain symptoms begin how do they evolve all of that is not so important you know why because we're interested in curing the problem and it is curable even though the Gaon of Vilna says very clearly that you cannot uproot a midah you cannot rid yourself of something that you were born with you can still neutralize it, you can still control it, you can discipline yourself to be whatever you want to be. And as the famous story with Rabbi Sayyid Salanter, he once came to town late at night, and you know, late at night everybody's asleep, but he sees a light from a distance in one house. Who, must, who could this be that still had, remember those, in those days they didn't have electricity. So if you had light, that means you had candles. And not everybody could afford candles. He must have been doing something important. So he knocks on the door, apparently he needed maybe some help in getting somewhere, and sure enough it's a shoe repair man, repairing some shoes. So Rabbi Salantra asks him, what are you doing up so late repairing shoes? He says, Rabbi, so long as the candle is still lit, you can still repair, you can still do work. As soon as he heard those words, he was shocked, he says, yes, that's exactly the message that Judaism preaches. So long as we have the neshama, so long as the neshama is lit, so long as we are alive, we can still do some repair work on ourselves. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu does not demand of one something that he cannot possibly do. He has given us the tools, and he has given us the Torah, to guide us in how to correct that which needs correction. And every human being needs to refine his character, that is part of what one does in this world is to perfect himself. Everyone has his unique mission, very specific and customized to him. And part of that mission, not an entire mission, but part of that mission is to refine his character in some way. And there are many, many midot, maybe one of these days we'll cover the, the various midot, the strengths and the weaknesses in the various midot, and how to channel them properly. It, it is not easy, but it can be done. So in Sefer Mishlei, besides the good advice and the Chokmah that Shlomo Melech shares with us, he tells us, or he makes us aware of certain midot, so that we should be cognizant of them, but also that we should realize how terrible they are, how damaging they are, that if we were to sit down and do nothing at all, we would be hurting ourselves, because we can do something about it. And he talks, believe it or not, he talks about two very negative Traits. I call them traits, even though I don't know what to call foolishness. Uh, foolishness is also a type of behavior. It's a certain state of mind. And it's also a lack of knowledge that leads to what we call foolishness. We're not talking about, when he says kesil, just remember, we're not talking about somebody who's mentally impaired. As we say it in Hebrew. We're talking about somebody that has a mind, has a sound mind, but he's a fool. And uh, a fool is someone that can make himself not a fool if he chooses to. 
Otherwise, why waste so many pesukim talking about what a fool is? Well, you could claim that he's telling us so you should stay away from him, not learn from him, but he's also talking to the Ksil himself. So obviously that even the Ksil himself can do work on himself and can repair himself. So he begins chapter 26, Perik Chavav Asfaus, Kashelek Bakaitz, a snow in the summer, the Chamatar Bakatsir, and like rain at harvest time. Ken lo navelech sil kavod. It is not a good thing, it is not befitting to give honor to a fool. What does it mean? What's snow doing in the summer? Snow in the summer or rain at harvest is not good for the crop. It is good to have rain in its time. It is good to have snow in the right time. To have rain or snow in the wrong time damages the crops. So you have to be careful, he says, in the same way that this rain is not, not, not only is it not helpful but it's actually damaging to the crops if you give kavod to a fool what is he going to think? that everything is okay with him and he's never going to attempt to make any tikunim any repair work on himself so it is not befitting you're doing him a disfavor it's actually damaging to him to give him kavod and not to rebuke him not to tell him off not to point out what he's doing is wrong. We're not talking about flattery here. Flattery in itself is, is a whole different uh, idea, different problem. We're talking about just giving kavod, being respectful, treating, you know, we're supposed to treat everybody nicely. But we cannot ignore the fact that if somebody is behaving like a fool, he has to be told so. No more tact. No diplomacy. Otherwise, he'll never learn. We're talking, obviously, about a Jew. We have certain responsibilities with Jews. And because of those responsibilities, if there's any chance for him to do any tikkunim on himself, he needs to be told by someone. And kavod goes against that. He cannot get all that attention because he will think that everything is okay with him. Katsipor lanud, kadror lauf, ken kilelat hanan lotavo. Now this pasuk has nothing to do with kisil. He switches over to another very, very significant idea. Like a wandering sparrow, like a flying swallow, various birds that love their freedom so so will a vain curse come home one has to be extremely careful not to curse because when one curses in vain it will eventually come back to him a curse is very powerful it could come back just like that weapon that you throw what is it what a boomerang it boomerangs back to you that's what a kelalak can do and not only a kilala unto others, especially so those people who are foolish enough to curse themselves. They say, "Behaye Abba Sheli, Behaye Ima Sheli," as they say in Hebrew. I, like they swear in their life of their father and their mother that something is true. They're cursing themselves. If Chazal Shalom, it's not true. Regardless, or, so, or those that curse their kids when they're upset at them and they say something not nice at them, even though they don't mean it. Words have a tremendous amount of weight. And these klalot, even though they may be in vain, it's a klalot chinam. Nevertheless, it could boomerang, it can come home. One has to be extremely careful. Rabbis tell us in the Gemara, Al birkat ediot kala be'inecha. Don't take lightly the curse of a simple individual. Oh, well, his curses don't mean anything to me. No, don't take a curse of a hediot of anybody lightly. Because if he happened to curse at the right time, and the individual who's being cursed is not the greatest tzaddik, and there's an accusation against him, it works just like an aynara, just like the evil eye. If a person is unprotected and not immune, the aynara will get him. Aynara, fortunately, is something that you can remove. Kilala is something much more difficult. Curse is much more difficult. Yes. that he doesn't have to worry about it. But about Aynara, you, can, you need to worry at all times, even if you didn't do anything wrong. It's a little bit much more sensitive. Yeah, you have to watch yourself, because there are people out there that can harm us in many ways, even if we didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> right? But there are ways to protect yourself, and another time we'll talk about that. So the rabbis learn about the curse. Where do they learn it from? They, they learn it from Avimelech. Remember the story with Avimelech and Sarah? Abimelech takes Sarah, wants to marry. He doesn't know that Sarah is married to Abraham because Abraham said, it's my sister. 
but of course he couldn't touch her. Sends, gives back Sarah to Abraham, and he makes a few statements to Sarah. I'm giving you back your husband, and I'm giving you all these gifts, so people should know the truth that I didn't touch you. That's the simple meaning of the Pesukim, and the simple translation of the word Kesut Einaim. This is a cover for the eye. In other words, this will be a cover. People will realize that nothing happened. The gifts that I'm sending you back, they will realize that nothing happened. But the rabbis tell us that there's a drasha from the word kesut and naima covered for the eyes that Abimelech actually cursed Sarah. Just like you mis- misled me and my eyes were covered from knowing the truth, so will your children's eyes be covered and be misled. Who is that? It's Haq. And he became blind as a result of that klala. Now we know that it's hard losing his vision, losing his sight, has to do with a lot of things. But it, all sorts of things. But it could be, according to this Midrash, that that curse, if it was meant as a curse, contributed to that too. So we see how, in this particular example, the curse not af- did not affect Sarah, but affected her children even, future generations. So a curse is something that one has to be extremely careful with. You don't want to be in anybody's mouth. Next pasuk. Shot lasus metek lachamor v'shevet legev kesilim. A whip is for the horse, a bridle is for the donkey, and a rod is for the body of fools. Animals, wild animals, need a whip sometimes to direct them, to get them to do what we want. Because it's a wild beast. What else could you do? You can't speak to it. So he says with a fool, sometimes that's the only cure. It needs a shevet. It needs a rod. We've talked about this before that Judaism very much believes that there are times that you need to use the rod as long as you don't abuse it, as long as you, your intentions are, are right, and as long as it's with certain individuals, not with everybody, then it should be used. It has certain positive results, the shevet, the rod. It, it does have results. And that's sometimes the only tool you could use that will be effective, where words alone would not do anything. So the fool, that's what he needs. This is very interesting because the following pursuit is an exact contradiction. Here it says, Do not answer a fool according to his folly, lest even you become like him. Don't argue with a fool. Otherwise people will think you, you're a fool just like him. People will not know the difference. And in the following pasuk, he says, Answer a fool according to his folly. What's the difference? Well, you have to read the entire pasuk to understand what's going on. The first pasuk says, Al tank silki valto, don't answer back according to his folly. Otherwise, pentish velo gamata, people will, will say you're just like him. You don't want to stoop down to his level. You, want, you don't want it to appear that you are just like him. And besides this, you may not win the argument because he's a fool. He's not logical. So don't waste your time. So don't answer him. If a fool argues and it's a fool, don't waste your time. However, the following pasuk, anek silki valto pen yechacham be'enav. Then he has the words pen yechacham be'enav. Answer a fool according to his father, lest he be wise in his sight. He may think if you don't answer back, if you don't put him in his place, that he's right and you're wrong. So if we're talking about ordinary arguments and ordinary discussions, don't get involved with him. Don't answer back everything he says. You don't, ha- you, don't ha- you don't owe it. You don't owe him an explanation. You don't owe him anything. But if we're talking about milei de shemayim, things that have to do with halachot, things that have to do with Torah, then he has to be told the right thing. He has to be told what's right and what's wrong. So you can't just sit back and, and do nothing. So it all depends on what's, what's involved, what the discussion is all about. Ordinarily, just fighting and arguing about silly things and about mundane things, don't get involved and don't answer back a fool. It's a waste of time. It may be embarrassing too. People might get the wrong idea when they see you argue with a fool. But when we're talking about chokhmah, Torah, mitzvot, we don't want him to think that he's right. We don't want him to think that he's hakam. And therefore we have to point out his mistakes. Next pasuk. Mekatse raglaim hamas shoteh this is a little bit of a difficult pasuk and there's different interpretations 
we'll, we'll just cover one interpretation. He who sends a message by the hand of a fool wears out his legs and drinks violence. Okay, that's a little bit difficult. Even the English is difficult. But one interpretation of this pasuk says as follows. Let me read the end of the pasuk first. Sholeh devarim biyat kisil. You've made the kisil your messenger. You made him take care of something for you. That was not a, a, a smart thing to do. Because he will do it wrong. Chances are that uh, he will fail in his mission. Something will go wrong. And what will that bring about? That will bring about mekatsera glaim. That will bring about that you will have to run back and forth and wear out your feet to fix the mistakes of the fool. And in the process of doing that, Hamas shote, you will drink violence. What that means is that you will drink or absorb all the insults of the people. Why did you send me this guy? Why, why did you ask him to do this and take care of that? You knew that he's not responsible. So it's not a good idea to involve a fool in a very important mission. Again, this is another description of what? Of the lack of responsibility that the fool has. He does not have responsibility. He's not somebody that you can therefore trust. It's telling us a little bit about him, who he is. It's not that he's completely uh, ignorant. He's just not responsible. He's not responsible and therefore a person who's not responsible, he's not serious. A person who's not serious, he's not sikhli, he's not logical. Therefore you cannot argue with him, you cannot easily teach him. And there are people like that. There are people who the normal discussion or logical conversation with them will not go anywhere. They, will, they just have their interest in mind perhaps. They don't follow what you're saying. They're not interested in what you're saying. So you definitely don't want to use them for an important mission. Next, Pasuk, This is also a little bit of a difficult Pasuk, but basically the translation is as follows. The thighs seem raised to a lame man. Pisach is somebody who's lame, crippled. And to him it appears, Dalyushokayim, that the thighs of others are higher, are more elevated. This is an expression, or a mashal, um mashal bifi chesilim. This is an expression that the, the kesil, the fool, uses to describe how the chokmah is above him, just like the thighs of others, just like the just like the thighs of others are above the lame. So is the chokmah, the learning, something so difficult and so much so beyond him that he doesn't think about it as something that is accessible. But we know that it is accessible. But the, the seal has an attitude, and the attitude is that these things are beyond him, it, they're too difficult. And we've covered this before in different words, Ramon Merak says it many times, that his attitude is wrong. He does not even try. He looks at everything as being so far and removed and difficult. Whereas the Chacham says, wait a minute, let me open up the Seper, let me try, let me, let me, let me learn one Pasuk at a time, and eventually he becomes a Chacham, he learns everything. That is the right attitude. An interesting mashal with the Chafetz Chaim describing certain individuals. And it goes like this. There was once a businessman who wanted to travel and he wanted to get there in the morning. He wanted to travel at night. So like this, he can sleep in the agala, in the wagon, and get to his destination, you know, the following morning. Just like we today take the red eye when we go to the East Coast. You want to get there right away in the morning. You know, it's hard to sleep on the plane, but some people do it. It saves them time. So he got into the Agala, and he tells the one who's driving the Agala, you know, listen, I'm going to go to sleep. Just make sure that you stay on track, on the road. You don't allow the horse to go off the road. It's important that I get to where I need to get to, and I'm very tired, so I'm going to go to sleep. I won't have time to tell you if you're going off the road. So please pay attention to the road and to the horse, uh, where the horse is going. You know, in those days, they didn't have satellite direction, GPS. GPS. Of course, the, he, he told them, don't worry about it, everything will be okay. But in the middle of the, of the trip, the Balagala, the driver, also fell asleep, had too much to drink. And what happened? Further down the road, the horse saw some fresh grass on the side of the road, and it went over. And as a result of moving over towards the fresh grass, the wagon tipped over. And they all fell into the mud. So he was, uh, of course, awakened. 
the businessman and he started yelling at the Baal Agala, you know, what did you do to me? I told you to watch the road, to be careful. He says, yeah, but my horse is a smart horse. I didn't think that this would happen. How could you talk about a horse as being smart? A horse is a horse. An animal is an animal. And when an animal sees fresh grass, what do you think it's going to do? It's going to go after the fresh grass. Unless you hold the reins. The Chafetz Chaim says that's exactly what happens to people right after Yom Kippur. Right after Yom Kippur, what's Yom Kippur? They've promised, they've said they're going to do the right things. How does it happen that right after Kippur they forget all their promises and their commitments and they go back to their animal way of life? So the Chafetz Chaim says, yeah, because a human being is like an animal. And if he does not rein himself in, if he sees fresh grass, he's going to go after the grass. If he does not learn Torah, if he does not stay on track, that's what's going to happen. You have to not fall asleep. That's what happens to those who are kisilim, who have the wrong attitude about something being too difficult, something out of reach. It is within reach, but you have to want to, and you have to always stay on track. Next, Pasuk, Kitzror Even Bemargema. That's similar to the first pasu we started off with talking about giving kavod to the Xila, that's not a good idea. In Pasuk Chet, he says, he who gives honor to a fool is, is like a binding, binding a stone in a slingshot. Ketzor even be margema. Margema is a slingshot. What happens to a stone in a slingshot? It's there one second, and the next second, it's gone. Same thing with the kavod. To the ksil. If you give kavod to the ksil, before you know it, a few minutes later, he's going to he's going to do something embarrassing. There's no purpose to give him kavod. He doesn't deserve kavod. It's not befitting to give him kavod. It's going to be gone. It's going to be a waste. You're not going to accomplish anything. You know, some people like to be nice to people. It's, it's it's good to be nice, but sometimes you really have to be tough. There's a time to be tough. You know, remember the the words of Shlomo Melech in Kohelet, la kol zman va'et. There's a time for everything, a time for peace, there's a time for war. There's a time to be tough. Time to be tough with, with kids. Time to be tough with fools. Time to be tough with those who are giving us trouble. So it's not the right thing is not to give them kavod. And if you do, it's going to be like a, a stone in a slingshot. It's just going to disappear. It's not going to do, do any good to him. Pasuk Tet, Hoach ala biyad shikoru mashal b'fi kesilim. A thorn came up in a drunkard's hand and a parable in the mouth of fools. Again, it's very cryptic. But basically this is what he's saying. Hoch is a thorn. A thorn in the hand of a drunkard. A drunkard goes to his yard. He's drunk. He doesn't realize what he's doing, where he's going. But he sees some flowers and he's trying to take a flower. But instead of grabbing the flower, he doesn't see right. He grabs thorns instead. The same is true with Mashal Befikesilim. In Hebrew, there's something called the Mashal and something called the Nimshal. Mashal is the parable, and Nimshal is the and Nimshal is the lesson. Let's call it the lesson. I think there may be another word for it. Exceed the moral, the moral, the moral of the story. Yeah, thank you. The moral of the story. So the Kesil, just like the, the the drunk man grabbing the thorn instead of the flower. He grabs the mashal and does not grab the moral. He does not look deeper as to what he's being told to him. He just looks on the surface. He absorbs the mashal, but the mashal is, is not significant. What's significant is the nimshal, the moral to be learned. The message also, sure. So anyway, that is why he loses out. He, he, never, is, he never fully grasps what is being told to him. It does not mean that he's beyond repair. Remember that. He, it, it is possible to sit him down, and I'm going to talk a little bit about it, about it more towards the end, what is missing and what needs to be done for people to get it right. Rav mecholel kol v'socher kesil v'socher ovrim. Also another pasuk that has various interpretations, but I think the following is the interpretation brought, mentioned by Rashi. The Master created all. Rav mecholel kol means Akadosh Baruch Hu who created everybody. And very interestingly, according to this interpretation, Shlomo Melech is telling us, Hashem who created everybody, guess what he does? Besocher kesil besocher avrim. He hires a fool. And he hires the transients. People who are going down the street. Guess what? The fool has a purpose in this world too. HaKadosh Baruch Hu uses them all. 
you can use a, a, a homeless person in the street. As the rabbis tell us elsewhere, Arbesh lichim la makom. A Kadosh Baruch Hu has many messengers to carry out his mission. As the famous story in the Gemara of a rabbi once observing a, uh, I think it was a frog crossing a river. And on the frog, piggyback, was a scorpion. And he's watching the whole thing. Wow. Pig, piggyback? You mean the, he's hitching a hike, a, a ride? On the, well, that's nice. I mean, since when is a frog a, a friend with a scorpion? You know, the, there are animals in, in Africa that are friends with birds. I think the rhinoceros is one of them. There are certain birds that pick pick the, the lice or whatever it is from their back. And there are some fish, too, that enjoy the other fish. But what's a scorpion doing in the back of a frog? So he said, I have a feeling that this is a mission. And sure enough, on the, I think on the way back, he sees the same scorpion catching a ride to return across the river. A few minutes later, he heard that somebody got bitten and died in his uh, community. That Scorpio was sent me a Shemaim to bite, to kill someone. And how did he get there? Piggyback on a frog. How? In a That's what he says here. The master created all. He hires a fool and he hires transients. He can hire anybody he wants. He uses everybody as tools. As one rabbi told the Romans, I think it was, listen, if you don't kill me, and I deserve to die. Hashem has many other messengers. He has bears and lions too that can do His will. In other words, don't think you are the one that's doing it. You're, you're all, all of this is a tool in the hand of Hashem. You're still guilty because you have the free will not to do it. Somebody else could do it. But, you know, there are many tools or many messengers to HaKadosh Baruch Hu to carry out His mission. A very interesting point here that He says that including fools you know, a fool can, can carry out a mission, I guess. He can, he can do something. So he's definitely worth something. So Hashem uses them all because we, human beings, we like experts. We like normal people. But Hashem doesn't mind. That man can do, do it, he'll, he'll use it. Kechelev shav al keo kesil shone bivalto. As a dog returns to his vomit, so does a fool repeat his folly. Did you ever see this? A dog vomits his food, goes back and looks at it and eats it again. Yeah. A dog will eat its vomit. It's a famous pasuk. Just like a dog returns to his vomit and eats it again, a fool repeats his mistakes, his folly. Most people, when they make a mistake, try to avoid repeating it. Okay, I learned my lesson. You can make a mistake, but don't repeat it. A fool repeats his mistakes because he doesn't learn doesn't learn from his mistakes. So you will, you will see, you will encounter such individuals who will make the same mistake more than once. Apparently there's some folly in them, unless they don't think it's a mistake. The rabbis use this pasuk to describe one who does an avera and repeats it. Now if somebody does an avera sin by mistake, it's what's called a shagaga. It can happen. He did not know, was unaware, did not see. But if the same mistake happens again, you, could you call it a shagaga? It's already almost not a shagaga. You should be more careful. You know, you know, and you realize what made you do that, whatever it was. So next time you should have been more careful. If a person is not careful and makes and does the same avera more than once, twice, and especially if he does it three times. Someone that does something three times, and if he does it once, as they say in this state, you do it three times and you're out. Three strikes, right? Yes. If it, it, if, if it was something that is done as a result of lack of information and she was never told, he or she was never told that this is wrong, then obviously this may continue for a whole life. We're talking about a situation where the person became aware or was told after the first time that this is not right. And still it comes back again. Obviously. Sure, sure. Yeah, obviously. And that's where he should have been more careful. Right. Once something happens three times, it's like it has become a chazaka. And from that point on, it's obviously... But even the third time, it's already a serious offense. 
as the rabbis explained, the second time is not like the first, the third time is not like the second, it all depends, and the fourth or the fifth is not like the third. Each one had, and if somebody did it at 22, it's not like if you did it at 55, you know, or, 50, or the other way around. There are various degrees in the offenses, and the more one does it, obviously, the worse it is. Yes? It's wrong. Okay. Obviously, you have to explain it to them. So if they were not explained right. the right way, then it's Yes, they didn't know. Right, sure, obviously. Just one more time. Yes. Mm -hmm. What if he or she slip? <coughs> what does that mean if they slip? Like, he or she knows. <coughs> he or she forgot and slipped. Oh, that's exactly what we're talking about. Once you know what the problem is, then you have to take precautions that it shouldn't happen. So it all depends on the circumstances. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're, to the, we're regarding this person as a fool. Is that what that, that's a fool uh, that the fool behaves in this way, that he's not careful. This is not a normal person to talk about. This is a person who's uh, more or less a fool. You might want to come to the Rosh to the Kachil. Rosh well, I mean, this is an individual who behaves like a fool. A fool meaning that he's not intelligent, uh, but it's not because he's ignorant, but because he, that's the, the personality or the, the type of person he is, that he doesn't pay attention uh, to his mistakes. He's not serious about life. It's a certain personality. It's, I, don't, I wouldn't even call it a personality. It's just a certain type of person, a shote, a fool. Um, just like you may have heard in Yiddish, there's two individuals. One is called a shlumazel, and one is called a shlumil. Have you heard that? Yeah. You know what the difference is? The shlumil is going down the hallway with a hot cup of tea, and he drops it on somebody. He's a shlumil. And the shlumazel is the one that had the cup of tea dropped on him. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah, so sure. There is a difference between a fool and the Rosh Ra. Right? And the what? Between a fool and the Rosh Ra. What's between Rosh? A fool and an evil person. A, a Rasha, you mean. A Rasha. A, a wicked man. Sure. A sure, a wicked man is, he's not a fool. You know, he could be a smart individual, but he's wicked. His intentions are bad. His designs are evil. Yeah. Sure, that's, that's my introduction. If he or she is right. forgiven, it's okay already? If, if that person... Teshuvah is always acceptable. Okay. Shuvah is always necessary as long as it's sincere. And Hashem okay. knows if one is sincere and he is going to try his best. And, and, and it was, well, it was my mother and she... That's good, that's fine. Sure. Anyway, yes? That Leitzim is a person who mocks, you know, mocks others, he makes fun of others. It's a different kind of person. Yeah, he's not necessarily a fool. Uh, he's worse than a fool. I mean, he's, a, he's closer to a rasha, to mock others, uh, or to mock mitzvah. He's closer to a rasha, so much so that the rabbis tell us that the, there are various groups, shenan mekablot ne shekhinah, that when they leave this world, they will not see the shekhinah. One of them is kat letzim, the group of mockers or scorners, or clowns, however you want to call them that don't take life seriously, and, but that's not enough. They cool others off, too, from doing mitzvot as a result of their behavior and attitude in, in dealing with people, so they're dangerous. So fools can also be... People. No, fools are not. They, so people, people, people know them. People recognize them. They, you know, this guy is just a fool. So what is yeah. a fool? Do you think everyone has a little bit of a fool? A lot of, a lot of people do things foolishly, <laughs> right? But they're not necessarily fools. What is a fool? Yeah, well, what do we just say? How did we describe a fool? He will make the same mistake over and over again. Hopefully, whoever did it made a mistake, and he's not a fool, he will not, re he will not repeat the mistake. He will be careful next time. So how would yeah. you describe the new Terry Carter going over to uh, Iran? Are those fools? Or are, they, are they evil? What, what's the description of them? All of the above. All of the above. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay.
Okay, let's go on. Before we go on, uh, perhaps I should mention what the Gemara says elsewhere about teaching certain individuals. It says, uh, on the, it relates it to a fool. Just like you're wasting your time by giving kavod to a fool, by teaching a fool, by trying to be logical with a fool. The same is true with a shonele talmid sheno hagun. Whoever teaches a student who's not a good individual, who's not a good man, who's not serious about learning, he doesn't have pr- good character, it's kezorek le mar- kezorek even le markolis. It's like throwing a stone to the worship called Markolis. Markolis was a kind of avodah zarah that the way you served it was by throwing a stone at it. That is the way you gave kavod to it. The rabbis used that as an example to describe that just like the stone does not accomplish anything there, does not contribute anything, neither does one who teaches the Talmud Shino Hagun. But it's worse than that. Whoever throws a stone to the Markolis, zu avodata, that's the way you worship it. And because of that, even though you didn't intend it, you wanted to make fun of it, still you're a hayab, because that's the way it's worshipped. So the same, in the same way, if one teaches an individual who should not be taught, it's like he's throwing a stone to Markolis, in other words, he's doing the wrong thing. It could be damaging. It, it's not a, not a good idea to teach especially certain things to certain individuals. For example, Kabbalah in the past was not taught to everybody. It was only taught to certain individuals who were ready to learn the mysteries or the secrets of the Torah. It could be damaging. So you have to be careful who you, you're teaching the Torah to. Yes. So how do you help a fool cure himself? I'm going to leave that towards the end. Okay. I'm, going to t- I'm going to give you some tips. God created yeah. To yeah. Do it. Another, another Mamar Chazal, another uh, saying that rabbis tell us about, uh, like throwing a stone to the Markolis, is one who does a favor to his friend, and that friend never recognizes the favor. It's like you just wasted a favor on someone. It's also compared to throwing an Evan to a Markolis. In other words, you're not accomplishing anything. You're not contributing anything. You may not want to do it again. If he doesn't appreciate it, he doesn't recognize it. When they're being ungrateful, then they don't recognize your favor. You know, so what, what good is it? Yeah. Oh, obviously, if they need your help, if, if it's, a, it's still going to be a chesed, yeah. But it's almost like wasted. It's like if it's not appreciated, what good is it? If they don't realize that you're doing them a favor. That it's something that they can they're benefiting from. Yeah. Yeah, but you, you want to be wary of these people. If somebody does not appreciate it, you know, maybe you shouldn't do it. It all depends what it is exactly that you're doing. Like, like, like what parents do for, for their children. No, that's something else. That's it's an obligation and your duty uh, to uh, help your children. I'm, I'm talking more about between two individuals that you're helping him out, and he does not see how you're helping him out. Right. Takes it for granted. It's it's definitely not a good midah. And it's like it's being wasted, because a person should be thankful for everything that he receives from Hashem and from other individuals. Ra'ita, this is the last pasuk concerning the kesil. Ra'ita ish hacham be'inav tikva lechsil mimenno. If you see a man who is wise in his own eyes, there is more hope for a fool than for him. A fool sometimes realizes that he did something foolish, believe it or not, even though he's a fool. He sometimes realizes that he acted foolishly. One who thinks he's smart, Raita ish chacham be'enav. If you ever meet up with somebody who thinks he's smart, tikva lechsil mimeno. There's more hope for the fool, because the one who thinks he's smart will never think that he did anything wrong. You see, you see what I mean? This is more. This is even more dangerous. A person who thinks that he's smart, who thinks he knows it all, a fool has more hope than him. Another point that I will leave towards the end, but something to be careful with. Now let's go over to the lazy man. Laziness is something that he covers many, many times in Sefer Mishle. And all the time that he talks about laziness, he always adds something. There are various degrees in laziness. They're all very damaging. A person cannot advance in life a lot if he's lazy. It is a terrible midah. And many people have it in various degrees. We're not talking about if you had two hours of sleep last night and you haven't had your coffee yet. 
you're going to be tired. That's called tired. That's not, no, laziness is something completely different. It has nothing to do with uh, being tired. It's a lack of stamina also, perhaps a lack of desire, a lack of interest. It's a combination of many things. But there are various levels and degrees, and he therefore emphasizes how terrible this midah is in so many areas in life that if, it, if one does not work on it when, when the child is young, it could, it could become very difficult to correct later on. It's not beyond repair, but it's one of those things that the earlier you catch it, the better. And he gives various descriptions of, of this laziness, of what it does and how it uh, evolves. Amar Atzel Shachal Badarech Ari Ben Arechovot Talking about a lazy man, he says The lazy man says there is a middle, there's a lion in the road or there's a lion between the streets in trying to give excuses as to why he's not going to a Shi'ur Torah He says, right now? Beverly Boulevard? There are thieves There are holdups There are lions in the street It's dangerous and we know it's not true. Then why would he say that? It's just an example of an excuse, not necessarily a lion. It could be anything else that the lazy man will think of to rationalize or to justify why not to do what should be done, and that is to go to Shiva Torah instead of just laying back and sleeping. So what do we see from this? That the lazy man thinks deep down that he has no need for this, if he had felt a true need, he would not necessarily stay home. So initially Shlomo, even though he doesn't say it in this words, that's how the commentaries explain. Since this is tied to learning of Torah, one way of justifying not learning Torah is that he feels that there's no need for it. But he doesn't say that. What does, what does he say? No, oh, it's dangerous out there. It's too late. I got something else to do. And it's not true. So you're dealing with an individual who will probably lie. Why? Because he will try to justify. He will not be sincere in saying the truth. Nobody likes to talk about his faults. Nobody will point out, I'm lazy. That's why I'm not going. I don't think I've ever heard somebody telling me that. Yeah. I, I'm trying to think, did anybody ever tell me I'm not going because I'm lazy? No, I don't think so. <laughs> what is that? Yeah, that, we're going to get to that next. There are some people who are actually lazy to eat too. Yeah, well, yeah, that's what he talks about next. Adelet isov al tzira ve'atzel al mitato. As the door turns on its hinge, so does a lazy man on his bed. Right, <laughs> left. <laughs> right, left. It's 8 o'clock in the morning. He's still in his bed. The alarm clock rang. Second ring. Doesn't get up. Phone call. Doesn't get up. This is a description of an individual who will not move out of his bed even though it's very easy for him to get up. What's the big deal? Just get up and just, you know, get dressed. You don't have to go outside. Just get up. No. Even to get up is hard. The commentaries explain that laziness has an effect not just in Torah, in many areas of life. Right? You may not want to go send a letter, you know, in the, put a letter in the mailbox down the block. He'll get into his car and drive two blocks. And we know it's healthy to walk, but he's lazy. So the laziness causes problems in many areas of life. Yes. All right, so should we use the word indolent? <laughs> he's depressed. He's indolent. He's, uh, whatever. Yeah. He's actually yeah. Uh, Because it because it's 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 a very sharp word. Sure. Yeah, but but when we learn Mishle, everything is acceptable, because we're talking about the nature of the human being. Yes. It's harder to cure with an older individual who is already set in his ways. Yeah. Well, it all depends on who their spouse is. Yeah, you know, yeah. Yeah, you know, well, you know. Hopefully, when you get married, you have help. You know, and if one is a little bit lazier than the other, then the other one will help out. Oy vavoy, if the two are lazy, right? <laughs> Nothing will get done. 
right? Yeah. All right, we'll just have a couple more pesukim. Taman atzeli yado batzalachat nilala shiva el piv. The lazy man buries his hand in the cauldron, in the pot. It worries him to bring it back to his mouth. He already put his hand in the pot, and now he's lazy, and he doesn't want to put it back in his mouth. What's going on? This is obviously a description, not of somebody who wants to eat, and now he's too lazy to put the, the spoon in his mouth, but an individual who begins with something and just doesn't have what it takes to finish it. He's lazy. A lot of people have this problem. They begin with a new project, they're all excited, then they're just lazy to finish it. It's, it's too bad because nothing gets done this way. Commit yourself to do something, finish it. Whoever begins with a mitzvah should, should finish the mitzvah, not let the others finish it for him. Different degrees of laziness, different areas in life where laziness can affect one. And as a result of, of course, this midah, one does not accomplish too much. Chacham atzel be'inav mishiv'ah mishivei ta'am. Lazy man in his own eyes is wiser than seven men who give advice. This is a description of an individual who's lazy, but who thinks he's smarter and he knows better. What is he saying? He's basically saying that a lazy man will come up with excuses to justify everything that he does or does not do. Now, this does not only mean that a lazy man will come up with excuses. We spoke about this in the past. A drunk or one who has some other addiction will also try to justify. Even after you've told him and showed him the x-rays, you're damaging your lungs. And he's going to say, well, I don't have the problem. It's my wife's fault or it's his fault. Or there's nothing wrong with me. I'm perfectly fine. Usually that is very much the excuse or the rationalization or the justification that one comes up with to try to defend himself and not, of course, blame, take the blame for anything that he does. But a la lazy man is one of those individuals too. He's not going to blame himself and he's going to come up with some excuse of why not to do what he's doing. What I've done now is after we've just seen a little bit about what these midot do to an individual, I just put together a few tips of... Uh, how to deal with them. We always have to be aware that the Yetzirah is a very powerful foe, an enemy that the rabbis tell us is out there to get us from day one till the age of 120. At all times, and he wears different costumes, even if you defeated him yesterday, you may not defeat him tomorrow, so don't be overconfident of yourself. The Yetzirah has many ways to get to us, and he misleads us. And the reason I'm saying this is because in talking about foolishness, not so much laziness right now, a person is biased. Adam Karov Latzmo, the rabbis say. And because of his bias, his brain acts like an attorney to justify, I'm right, he's wrong. This is okay. This is acceptable. The Allah would probably agree with me. It's very easy for a person to say that because nobody likes to make mistakes. Nobody, likes to be, nobody, likes, nobody wants to think of himself as being wrong or having done an Avera, Chaz Shalom. You really have to be Ish Emet, a true person, to, uh, to admit your faults, to not, you know, uh, be misled by the Yetzir, to believing that you're right. You really have to be completely an Ish Emet and sincere person. And most people are not like that. Human being is not like that, unless, of course, he learns Torah. Lashon Ara is another area where people make the mistake. On him, it's a mitzvah to say Lashon Ara. I've heard that. On him, it's a mitzvah to say Lashon Ara. Whoever told you that? His attorney here, if he had consulted with a rabbi, not with a book, because a book, you can also say, well, probably this is what he meant. No, this is a different case. Had he consulted with a rabbi who's not biased, then it would have been much more objective. It's hard for us to be objective if we are the ones that are involved. So Lashon Ara is one of those areas where one has to be extremely careful because it's very easy to talk a lot of people like to look down, especially if that man is rich and somebody is jealous of him, then it's going to be easier for him to speak Lashon Ara about him because he's also jealous of him, you see? So unless he has to somebody to tell him, listen, be careful, you know, this is Lashon Ara, he may not know it. And he, may, he may allow himself to continue. And you know where Lashon Ara begins? On the dinner table, on Shabbat, husband and wife talking about, oh, you know that she's uh, pregnant. What business is it yours that she is pregnant? It's, it's, it's Lashonara. You know that? It's not important. 
It's not necessary. It's, it's not information that you have to give over. What, what is your child, the doctor that's going to deliver her? You know, what are you giving that information for? As long as you say it that way, that's different. <laughs> then you're saying, then you're saying, Baruch Hashem, Akadosh Baruch Hu, you see miracles, they got the bracha, that's maybe different. Yeah, that's of course different. Yes. What if um, you're discussing, uh, let's say, situation, talk about let's say, a doctor or a accountant. So you're discussing right. with someone about what you think about them and you know, you're saying like, you know, if the... It's different because that's beneficial information. Shiduchim is a very sensitive area. If one of the two is, is, is sick, has a problem, you have to tell them. You have to tell the one who's thinking of dating him or her, listen, there's a problem, so, such and such a problem. And if you don't say, you're putting a stumbling block before the blind, or un he's unaware of it. So we have to help those people who are about to begin a partnership, or about to get married, or date. Listen, this is something that I'm aware of. This guy doesn't pay his bills. You may not want to sell him. He doesn't pay. His checks bounce. As long as you're not biased, you don't have anything against that other individual, you're being completely objective and, you're, and you want to help this man, then it's a mitzvah. Not only is it not a shonara, it's actually a mitzvah. Yeah. Personally himself, he had bad experiences, sure. Yeah. Well, Rabbis always tell us, Kabdeo Vechashdeo, whenever you hear any information, whenever you see an individual, you have to give him the benefit of the doubt, give him kabot, but be suspicious of him. So if this individual, you don't trust him 100%, at least, well, maybe there's a 50-50% chance that his information is accurate, and I better be careful. Suppose Why take a chance? Suppose the tenant doesn't pay you the rent. Right. And somebody else is asking about him. It all depends on the circumstances. If he never pays, he didn't pay once. It all depends. You you but really have to be careful. Yeah. 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 Another let, let's just 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 another tip or two. Person should be very careful not to think that he knows all. We don't know everything. We, there's There's always room to learn to learn from others. We don't know it all. We may have some experience, we may know certain things, but we should always be open to the idea of listening to others and to seeking the advice of others. If a person does not seek the advice of others, he thinks he knows it all, he does not have to consult with others, then he's a fool. That's an example of a fool. That's a foolish attitude. And, last but not least, very, very important to regularly learn Musar and to be willing to accept criticism of others because if a fool has any chance to correct himself, this is his chance. If he's willing to listen to criticism of others, if he's willing to learn Musar. Because once a person opens up a Sefer Musar, once he allows himself to receive Tochacha from others, then he has a chance that those words will penetrate his Neshama and will make a difference and he will begin a, a, a new life, he will make a commitment. So even though he acted like a fool, if you get him to listen, if you somehow you succeed in bringing him to a class and have him listen, the words will enter his, you know, his neshama. He's not blocked. He's just behaving in a foolish way. He's exceed. If you get him, if you succeed in bringing him to a class, if you succeed in giving him musara, and he accepts tochacha, criticism, then he, ha then he has a chance. If a person does not accept criticism, does never learn musara, then he probably will never repair his any midot whatsoever. He may be a millionaire, he may be happily married even, maybe, but he will not have succeeded in repairing one midah. And that's a, that's a shame because whoever did not repair one midah, according to the rabbis, did not accomplish anything in this lifetime. Yes? Rabbi, why uh, in that context, when uh, Rabbi Israel Salat Right. Why was there objections from other Moshe Shivas? The way you're talking now, it's, it's very fundamental that Musa is, is an important element of daily life. Right. Musa, but Musa, you must remember, in the past, Musa was not so much in a, a class form. that you, you sat down and you learned Musa. Musa was something that you got from learning Gemara, from learning Chumash. You can get the Musa from learning all of those. So there was never a school 
and not too many books that were just dedicated to working on Midot. Until the Hasidic movement came in, until, until the Musa movement came in, that they put an emphasis on certain, on certain areas that need, one needs to work on. Sirat Yesharim, sure. You, you, you hold by the Musa movement being... Today, everybody holds by it. It has become part of the Jewish life, that Musa is a very important part of our life, and that we have to spend time learning it. The rabbis have done us a big favor in the past couple hundred years to put together Sifrei Musar and the various uh, subjects, uh, various midot that need work. And if we ignore them, then obviously, you know, we're not going to be accomplishing anything because the Shlom Bait can depend on this. If a person does not uh, work on himself, then it could affect the Shlom Bait. Uh, his relationship with others, his relationship with his parents, Everything depends on the midot. And Derech Eretz Katmar Torah, the rabbis tell us. To, to be a mensch, as we say in Yiddish, comes first before anything else. To be a good person. And most people, when they're born, they have some, something that, that needs correction. If they don't need any correction, then they should be amongst the angels, the you know, malachim. You know, if they're down here, that means there's something for them to correct. Okay, so Bezat Hashem will continue next week with this second half of the Perek.